Thanks, Liz, and thanks to the organizers for having us uh, at No Time to Wait. We're very excited to be here. Uh, my name is Jester Fos, and I'm here together with Mary, uh, my colleague, uh, talking about what we've learned from publishing our catalog metadata as linked data. Um, so I'm working as actually in the last few weeks at Sound and Vision, but still very happy to be here and present on this work. But I'm a product manager at Sound and Vision. Um, as such, I'm responsible for translating the needs and requirements for uh, a specific group of people, heritage professionals, uh, to services and, and uh, work that, uh, that we can provide to them. Um, and uh, Mary is a software developer and a uh, linked data expert. Um, so very glad that she's with me today. And um, so we're presenting work that was done with a larger group of people. So I just wanna give a shout out to those uh, that were involved. Uh, you know who you are, uh, we appreciate you. Um, so why do we want to publish our uh, catalog metadata as linked open data? Um, it starts with a simple assumption that we don't, as an institution and our collection, it doesn't exist in isolation. Uh, we want to connect to the world around us in order to be able to provide a better access, but also provide more context to our collections. And um, one particular context in which we work is the Dutch network for digital heritage. Um, this is a, oh, I went too soon. Um, this is a collaborative network, uh, which has been working together for years. Um, and uh, this far reaching collaboration has led to a national strategy for digital heritage in uh, which we have defined three work packages or yeah, um, in which we organize the work into three packages um, which uh, are described in this national, national strategy. Um, the first one being um, uh, focuses on the visibility of heritage, which involves a campaign and uh, also insights on, on users. Um, the bottom layer focuses on sustainability and it's all about uh, digital preservation and the costs of preservation and policies and etc. Uh, and in between is this usability layer, uh, which I want to focus on most because that's what's most relevant for us here. Uh, so talking about user usability in this, we want to we've, we work together with uh, both suppliers of cataloging software, but also uh, just other heritage institutions to create what we call a distributed network of heritage information. Uh, and so we defined a number of principles in uh, a reference architecture, um, which uh, you can see here. Um, I, I, don't, I can't go into too much detail because we don't have enough time, but you can look this up online as well. Um, this reference architecture determines that heritage information should always be traceable to its source, that it should reference other information and be referenceable. And the way in which we do this is by providing access to our meta metadata as linked open data. Um, this we do at the source. So in other words, the institution that publishes the data continues to be the owner of this data um, and, and as closely as possible to them, we, we publish it. And then in all other places where this data is being used, we link to it rather than copy it. Um, and this is to ensure, uh, to tackle a number of, of problems. One of them being, uh, to keep the data up to date, uh, to make it trustworthy and referenceable and coherent in all places where it occurs to um, encourage, the, encourage the, or also increase the trustworthiness of the information. Um, so this is very specific to the Dutch context. I'm aware of that, but at the same time, we also see the same uh, sort of developments uh, arising in other contexts that we're involved with, for instance, um, Europeana, which currently is more data aggregation, but also there, there's the principles of being able to reference materials is very important. And we're also involved in other uh, European projects like the Polyphonia project, which is more about musical heritage. And there also we're building this knowledge graph of, um, of heritage and uh, musical heritage information. So in this uh, network in the Netherlands, we have a lot of portals that um, provide access to specific audience uh, audiences around selections of heritage materials from various institutions. So they kind of mix and match for what seems appropriate to their uh, thematic portal. Uh, these themes can be actual themes uh, like um, um, uh, Delft's blue pottery or um, uh, World War II, something I'll get back to later. 
Um, and they can also be regional or national. So there's all kinds of different ways of organizing um, these platforms. And they are very great at engaging with their communities, uh, reaching niche audiences that institutions themselves can't um, have access to. And they um, um, add specialized knowledge to um, the heritage objects from collections. Um, one such platform that I want to focus on right now is called the uh, Network Orlopsbronnen. Uh, it's a platform for World War II uh, documentation. And they go through great lengths at the moment to find and scrape and connect various online resources around World War II. And uh, one example that I can give you is then what they do is uh, they uh, relate all these different sources to each other, which provides this very rich historical uh, document. So for instance, the Westerbork film, which you see at the top, of the bottom left is uh, from our archive, which is then being connected to uh, documentation from the National Archives or um, interviews uh, from one of the deportation camps. Um, and uh, so then all these relationships become very apparent in their, um, in their portal. So the current situation is as follows. It's very complicated. So aggregators will aggregate materials and publish them on their portals. Uh, but sometimes the aggregators will aggregate from aggregators rather than from the original data source provider because of um, metadata formats, etc. So it's, it's become a very messy landscape of aggregation and copying of information, which, as you can understand, doesn't really help the um, uh, uh, data quality. Um, so the new situation looks more as follows, uh, where we, again, publish at the source, uh, but we also use, uh, we, we register data sets in a data set register uh, so that they can be found. We use a network of terms, which consists of various um, thesauri um, that can be used to describe collections. And when we share these terms, it becomes much more easy for these portals um, to allow querying with standardized terms. Um, so, we select relevant or what a thematic portal then only has to do is to select relevant information from all these data sets and, and to allow federated search across those. So what we've then done to uh, at, at Sound and Vision to become a part of this uh, infrastructure is uh, within what we call the Open Data Lab, we work towards fully participating in these kinds of, um, uh, in this international ecosystem of open data. And we do this in collaboration with users, in this case, the network for um, Orlogsbronnen, uh, the World War II docu documentation, and other partners. And this is our first real um, um, uh, product, you could say, that we're publishing. Um, but uh, so, so first thing that we set out to do was to look at our metadata um, and um, uh, figure out how we can publish this as open data because that allows third parties to use it without any restrictions. So we asked ourselves the question, is our metadata under copyright? And if so, who is the copyright owner? Uh, and an additional question, which is not so much related to copyright, but more to database protection, um, is, is there any protection on our database? Um, we quickly found out that for us, um, there is a lot of information that isn't copyright protected because it's just factual information and therefore doesn't conform to the notion of being a work. But descriptive fields that are more narrative driven and summaries uh, can be considered uh, protected by copyright. So for the time being, we selected a data set that did not contain uh, these descriptions, which is of course a shame, but um, it's worth quite something to apply a uh, CC0 license. Um, a part of our um, catalog descriptions come from public broadcasters and therefore we are not the copyright owners. In terms of database protection, uh, we are the uh, owners of the database. We've made the effort to publish them. Um, then also on content. So this was just about the metadata which we've published on the CC0. Of course, we would like to provide good insights into uh, the actual rights on our collection itself. And we have our own write statements in our collection um, database, uh, which are license check, blocked, license required, et cetera. And these are very specific to our context in which we often work with pro public broadcasters that want to reuse materials. And so these are very relevant to that con context, but they're not machine readable or standardized. And so we look, looked at mapping those to 
uh, writestatements.org and Creative Commons licenses so that they are more broadly um, used. So this was the first step. And then uh, Mary will tell you about our uh, Sparkle endpoints that we built up based on that uh, information. So over to you, Mary. Yeah, so I'll just take over the screen. Yeah. Board as well, you can see my slides now. So we wanted to publish our data on a Sparkle endpoint. Uh, in principle, this uh, required three steps, converting the data to RDF, using that to fill a triple store, and then publishing it. But in reality, those three steps actually turned out to be a climb of quite a steep mountain. And for a climb, you need a good climbing team. And in this case, we needed multiple disciplines as well. We needed someone to model the data. We needed a data architect to take care of the conversion workflows, making the data available, filtering out the, the parts of the metadata or the programs that we couldn't show for copyright reasons. We needed a software architect to put the infrastructure in place to support this, a DevOps engineer to make it easy to deploy and update the endpoint, front-end developers so that uh, our users could have a nice way to interact with the data, and last but not least, a copyright specialist to to navigate the thorny maze of licenses that Yasser just explained. Now, the first uh, step was uh, to convert to RDF. And for that, we need to choose a model. And that was already quite a challenge because our data at Standard Vision is very heterogeneous. We have descriptive metadata, titles, summaries, the people and the locations involved in an archive object. We have production metadata about how it was produced by who and when. Also broadcast metadata, when was it broadcast, in which medium, and by which station. Technical metadata that describes how it is stored. And finally, heritage metadata that uh, shows its importance in the Dutch cultural heritage and its meaning within Dutch society. So there is no single model that covers all of this. That's why we decided to create our own model that would consistently describe everything in our archive. And then per use case, map a portion of that data to an appropriate model. And in the case of Open Data Lab, we chose schema.org, as this is widely used and it provided good coverage for the key concepts that we needed for the Open Data Lab use case. And once we decided our model, we needed to be able to convert our data to it. First of all, we needed some name changes. So sometimes the database names are not very useful. For example, locations are, are called NISV geographical. So we map that in our own schema to the property has location and in schema.org to the location property. That's generally much clearer. We also needed some structural changes. For example, if you look here at how a, a member of a cast of a program is modeled in our data, then you have an actor name and a character name. But in schema.org, for the same uh, relationship you need to have the combination of a character name with a performance role and the performance role then links through to the actual person who played that role. And finally, we need to link concepts in the metadata to our thesaurus. For example, in this case, the actor Ariana Schluter is, exists in our thesaurus, so we wanted to link to her unique entry there. Because of all these steps that we required, we couldn't simply map database properties directly to RDF using tools such as Sparkle and anything. We did look at using RML, which is a mapping language that allows to map between different formats, but unfortunately this wasn't flexible enough for the changes that we needed to, to make. So we ended up going for a custom solution, which consisted of three parts. First, our data model, in which we said which RDF properties an archive object could have. Then we had a lookup file that said per property, which parts you could use to find the relevant information in the data. And finally, conversion code that took care of the restructuring. Put all three together and we had our RDF. The next step was to put that into a triple store. We looked at various ways of storing the data. We tried out uh, Virtuoso, but unfortunately that gave us serious loading problems that we couldn't resolve. We looked at the relatively new uh, technology of HDT for a more uh, compact triple store. This was wonderfully fast, but unfortunately it didn't support the complexity of queries that we required for our use case. 
And we ended up by choosing a Cleopatria, which is an open source triple store. And in our search for a triple store, we really noticed the difference between the academic triple stores that tend to be open source, they're being updated frequently, you can really interact with the people who are building them, but which don't really offer production support, they're not optimized for performance, and you certainly can't ring the developers up at midnight on a Sunday to say that the whole thing's gone down. So the, you have on the other side, the more commercial operators who would provide more support and more optimization. But it's very difficult to work out what you're going to be getting before you've paid for it. So we'd be very interested in hearing about other people's experiences in the triple stores that they have chosen. We wanted to fill our Cleopatria triple store with the data. First of all, we needed to look up a list of the, the more than 2 million archive items that we have. For each item, we needed to convert the metadata to RDF and load that into the triple store. This process worked very well, just it takes time. So about three weeks to load the whole archive into a triple store. Once we had our uh, data, we wanted to publish it. We needed to choose a domain URL strategy for the URLs for the concept. We wanted them to be logical and readable. But at the same time, we're not the only people at Sound and Vision who are using URLs. So we needed to make sure that uh, our naming strategy fit in with other names at Sound and Vision. And finally, URLs for the linked data need to be persistent. So we had to choose something that was built to last. We don't want to have to change them in one year or even five years time. To publish the data, we used a Docker container and published it in Amazon Web Services. And what did we publish? Well, we have various uh, ways to interact with the data. The first is an API that uh, dereferences the, the, the concept. So if you have the identifier for a particular program, then you can retrieve the RDF describing that program. And we have profile negotiation, so you can choose, do you want to see that data in schema.org, or would you prefer to use the Sound and Vision custom schema? We also have uh, content negotiation, so you can choose, do you want it, that data to be in the format of JSON, or Turtle, or XML, various options. And uh, the API then uh, generates that uh, metadata on the fly. So that's uh, great for retrieving individual concepts, but to search, we need to use that triple store and have a Sparkle endpoint on it. And we have a Sparkle endpoint that allows uh, computers to carry out automated queries. Or if you're here, Being it redirects you to a query editor where you can fill in a query. This blank white box that you have to fill in what would be a useful query. So just to define a number of example queries, have a look at what's available and what's possible, and then take queries and modify them to get to do exactly what they want. Finally, we need people to, to know that our data set is there so that they can work with it. And yes, I'd already discussed the uh, Dutch network for digital heritage, but they have uh, developed uh, guidelines for how you can describe such a data set. And we've described our data sets in a, a way that's compliant with that. And th those, these descriptions are also made available in the same API. The story doesn't end there. We have plenty of future work still to do. We need to find out ways of regularly updating the data. We want to explore more use cases and see what their requirements are. Perhaps we need more metadata fields, perhaps mapping to different schemas, or access via other methods such as OAI, PMH. We would like to extract structured data from text to make that more searchable, to explore how we could offer uh, the, the audiovisual material itself. And of course, if it's linked data, we want to link to more sources. But finally, uh, Mary, we have we some issues with, nice your, uh, way with the connection. And that's uh, something that we are a version of the open data. What's the last thing you heard? <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes, hey, we also just wanted to remind you that um, we have four minutes left for questions and answers. So um, um, you might want to wrap up so that we can at least get in one question. 
Yeah, I think we're done here. Sorry, Mary, the connection was uh, just the last few minutes wasn't so good. Uh, so these are so we're publishing these data sets on an actual uh, labs uh, website, and uh, you, you will soon uh, publish that uh, publicly. So then you can start using them yourself if you want. Um, and that's pretty much the end of our presentation, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Mary. Yeah. Okay. So if there's any questions, we'd love to take them. Oh, rats. Okay, so there was a question in the the, the chat that I, I know you did respond to yesterday, but um, uh, just to ask it again for everyone. A uh, question about the thesauri uh, yesterday mentioned, uh, who creates them? Does Sound and Vision contribute to or maintain any? And if so, yeah. think about that process a bit. Yeah, yeah. so uh, we have our, uh, what we call the GTAA, which is a, um, a, a thesaurus, meant to describe audiovisual collections, which is a very broad uh, thing, of course. So it's quite a big thesaurus. Um, and we do take contributions from other parties. So we are, we are managing it, but uh, we have, uh, for instance, the public broadcasters, but also some of the, our cultural heritage partners will uh, suggest new terms as concept terms. Uh, this they do through the API mostly, but also sometimes just via email and then our media management uh, or metadata managers will evaluate these terms and add them if, uh, if they see, uh, deem that appropriate. Okay, great. Um, um, Radoslav asked uh, you to say something more about um, um, the N L E E U L D and the- I think, I think it's meant to read built and Geluid Lab. Is yeah. that what it's supposed to read? I think so. Yeah, so the, the Open Data Lab is just one example of a, a lab. Um, working in labs, we've done in a sense for some time, but mostly in the context of research. So the Claria Media Suite is a, a research tool that is developed by a lab, which is um, a um, uh, collaboration with external partners, evaluating with users and, and building it uh, on like um, in a step-by-step uh, basis. So we've now applied these same principles to the Open Data Lab, which is focused around publishing our collection and our collection metadata as, uh, as open data. And we foresee a number of other labs around, uh, for instance, speech to text um, and other innovative topics to also take that structure because it allows us to be more flexible and, uh, as I said, really work with external partners. How to apply? <laughs> if you wanna, if you wanna work with us in a in a lab, uh, either as a user or uh, you have some ideas of yourself, yeah, please do be be in touch with us. Um, we'd love to discuss how we can organize it. Um, it all depends also on the part of uh, work that we do in labs is also dependent on external funding. Um, so there, there are of course some limitations to work around sometimes. But yeah, we're, we would be happy to um, to hear from you. All right, we are at time. So thanks very much again to Marie and Yesse. Um, and um, excellent presentation, very interesting. And uh, now I'll hand over to Alessandra to close out today's session.